Okay, good afternoon. Hope you are well. Uh, welcome, Dominic. Good to see you. Thank you very much for accepting uh, the offer to, to join us in the dialogues of the Global Health Festival that is currently ongoing as a program. Um, welcome everyone who is following presently in the session. The session is uh, the strategy of inclusion of persons with disability in the developing countries actually is not stopping in front of COVID-19. So just a couple of words of introduction. Uh, my name is Chiara Anselmo, working for CBM Italy and I'm responsible for advocacy in Italy. And let me introduce Dominic. Dominic Schluckhofen, he's uh, working for CBM International. He's a director of the community, inclusive community-based development in the CBM International. And he's currently leading a team of experts who know actually how to include persons with disabilities and they know their needs and they know how to you know, address that within the communities and the programs of CBM. Just a couple of words of CBM, about CBM, because I think, uh, of course, we know, <laughs> uh, probably not everyone within uh, this session know uh, who is CBM. So CBM uh, is an international Christian development organization and is committed to improving the quality of life of persons with disabilities in the poorest communities of the world. And we mainly work in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and just to give you, a, you know, an idea of the figures and the size of what we do, um, last year we reached over uh, 10,700,000 direct beneficiaries, so persons with disabilities, families and communities. And we did that in uh, 51 countries and with 540 projects. So that's what we do as a CBM. Um, but before going uh, further up, uh, Dominic, I think we are lucky because uh, thanks to the, the Festival of Global Health, we have finally a chance. Uh, in the development sector, we have a very bad habit uh, and we use a lot of jargon, acronyms, etc., etc. Yeah, we, It seems that we don't want people to understand. Uh, so here we go, we provide another acronym, which is CBID, uh, but hopefully we have a full session to finally disclose what CBID is and mean and how much is beyond, you know, this just the name of CBID. So that would be your task, Dominic. But um, let me just give you a scenario of uh, persons with disabilities um, you know, in the pre-COVID, the pre-COVID-19 phase, because I think it was already full of challenges. Um, as we know, um, and that is the United Nations stating that, uh, we have uh, a good one billion persons with disabilities worldwide. And that's quite a number, and it is about 15% average uh, of the world population. And the world population is increasing, growing, uh, aging too, and we know the disparities, inequalities keep going, uh, though of course the efforts worldwide, you know, to, to face that. So uh, let's say the, the number of persons with disabilities, uh, it is increasing, that's a fact, right? Uh, but not only on the side, because um, as we know, 80% uh, of that billion of persons with disabilities live in the developing countries. So exactly where probably we have more fragile states too. And what the World Bank says, there's a strong link between poverty and disability that is stated also in the Agenda 2030, as we know, and the 20% of the world's poorest popul uh, population worldwide have a kind of disability. Let's say also that um, in the scenario, we need to consider that poverty and disability are strongly linked, and there's this vicious cycle between disability and poverty. And if you're a person with disability, you probably end up 
uh, lacking access to education, to healthcare, and ultimately, I would say, livelihood. And so you run the risk to become poor. But if you're poor, then you have less access to vital services, and then you run the risk to have a disability. So that is something, you know, on one side. Let's see the other side. So the other side, we have some good news, let's say. We have 177 countries who ratified the convention, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. So there is commitment, there is commitment there to, you know, to make life for persons with disabilities better. But we know that, especially the disability movement, is reporting almost daily that there is still room for improvement, let's say. A lot of room for improvement. So that was the scenario, pre-COVID scenario. Um, but there, already, we had the CBID, the CBID approach that we, we have. And it was already successful. It was a very, very successful in providing a positive, long-lasting impact on, on the life of persons with disability in the developing countries. Then COVID-19 came in. So I will just leave to you, Dominic. I already talked too much. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here and, um, and also for making us travel with you through this journey about knowing what is CBID. So let's start to disclose the acronym and what does CBID mean, Dominic? Please, over to you. Thank you, Tiara. Um, thank you for the warm welcome, first of all, and welcome to everyone who's um, joining the session. I'm quite excited um, to be here. It's a great opportunity to talk about CBID, uh, which stands for Community-Based Inclusive Development. And community-based inclusive development is essentially a way of working in the communities to ensure that persons with disabilities are respected and included in every aspect of life uh, and on an equal basis with, uh, with everybody else who lives in the community. Um, so it follows a human rights-based approach, and uh, you've yes. already mentioned the um, yeah. United Nations um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That is a major framework. The other one um, is the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I'm sure that have been uh, uh, discussed and talked about quite a bit in the context of this festival. So CBID is also an approach to actually implement the Sustainable Development Goals on the ground and in the communities. And um, I would say two key elements of CBID are one is it's people-centered, so it means yeah. persons with disabilities are at the center, having a choice and control over their own lives. Um, they're at the core of every CBID program and intervention, and also it's community-driven. That is the other element that is key um, to our CBID approach. That means we focus on community engagement and ownership. Everything that happens in the CBID program is actually driven by the community from the beginning to the end of the program. So I hope this is a first um, start to explain. We're starting. <laughs> yes, we are starting to get the, the meaning. Uh, I need to provoke here a bit, uh, Dominic. Uh, what you said is actually what is in the convention. So uh, what what is the need, the specific need, Syria uh, can up? You know, uh, it, it was necessary. It was necessary to have a CBID because there was a need to be addressed that probably the convention or the commitment of the governments were, was not sufficient in a way. So, or there were gaps somewhere. So why, why was CBID developed? Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So you've already mentioned in your introduction that there are roughly 1 billion persons with disabilities um, living across the world. Very often, uh, persons with disabilities are marginalized and they're discriminated against in the communities they live in. This is often worse and exacerbated in poor settings in low-income countries. Um, for example, persons with disabilities do not have access to basic services, um, they cannot see a doctor, um, children with disabilities cannot go to school, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, so to ensure that in these settings, inclusion can happen, CBID is a crucial approach. You need to engage with the communities um, and we follow a social model of disability. So the idea is that no one is disabled per se, but it's actually the environment in which a person lives that disables the person, the community, basically the person lives in. And to address exclusion, discrimination, Sorry, Dominic, we, did, we lost you. We, we lost you for, uh, for a couple of seconds. Um, now, I think you please talk. Let's see if... Uh, Dominic? We unfortunately lost connection with Dominic. Uh, Dominic. We lost the connection, I'm very sorry. This happened actually because we were coming to the. You can hear and see you. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Dominic, do you mind to write something? And I will try to read out. Uh, I can. I cannot hear. Sorry. I don't think. I don't think um, even the participants are hearing now. Um, would you, Would you mind to to continue if possible? to conversation and I'll try to, to also fill in what you cannot say. Let's try maybe if you connect again, we will be more lucky to have you. Sorry for this interruption. Apologize. Seems that. Let's see if Dominic Schulhorten can also join us again. Um, we were actually uh, saying about about how important is the CBID and and the need that is actually trying to to address in the communities of persons with disability in developed countries. Um, I'm trying to, to um, connect now with the connection, hopefully Dominic. Dominic, welcome back. Can we hear you, we see you. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry about that. So I, um, I don't know what happened. Um, I guess no problem. That's, we, that's our life. With in this modern life, exactly. Exactly. So, um, I don't, I don't know how far you you were able to um, to to get me, but your question was essentially why was CBID created? Exactly. And, um, I think that there's a very good reason for it because there is uh, one billion persons with disabilities across the world, roughly, and yes. uh, very often in their own communities they are actually discriminated, they are marginalized, and this is exacerbated in poor income settings, in low income countries. You're breaking, sorry, Dominic, again. Yeah. Um, to address the situation, um, uh, uh, CBID was actually, crea uh, was actually yes. created. Um, because you need, uh, we're coming from a social model of disability, so that means no one is actually disabled uh, per se, but it's the environment, the community that a person lives in that is disabling. Absolutely, and that's the, what the convention says. And therefore, to achieve inclusion, you have to you have to work with the communities and engage with the communities in a proper approach. And that is the the whole idea of CBID. Um, Thank you. I mean, I could, I could I could give you an example, for instance. Yes, um, please. Uh, 
Yeah. So if you so it's it's all about environment and attitude. So if you have an environment where, for instance, the wheelchair user is not able to access a school, um, you have you have an issue with inclusion. So you need to ensure visible accessibility. If you have an environment where a person who is blind and cannot see, or a person who uh, is hard of hearing and cannot cannot properly hear, has no access to communication. Uh, you have an issue. So you have to make sure that communication is accessible. So the environment actually in the community is really, really crucial um, to achieve inclusion. And that is why CBID essentially as an approach was developed uh, a long time ago and it's constantly uh, uh, evolving and why it's also so crucial to achieve the UN Convention and realize the Sustainable Development Goals. Sure. Thank you so much, Dominic. And I think by improving the environment in terms of barriers, free environment, it, it actually improves for all of us. It's not just about for persons with disabilities. So, so that's an enormous achievement for the whole community. Fantastic. So I think that that's, that is an accessible approach. We know we have evidence of that. Uh, but if someone listen to you now, I would like to, to start doing it. How to how to apply CBID? Where do you start from? It, it, it's complex. Uh, working with the communities is quite complex. You have a different sectors: health, education, empowerment, uh, livelihood, and then you have elders. So, where do you start from? And so, we, we can give some suggestion, you know, to, to the listener uh, if they want to approach this uh, strategy of inclusion. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you, Kiara. So uh, I think one of the, the most powerful things that CBID does is that it gives you an approach to actually um, deal with this complexity that is life in a community and then to uh, apply a consistent and flexible approach. So to give, you, to give you an example, how would you start? The first element is really to understand the situation of a community and more particularly the situation of persons with disabilities in their community. So one of the first elements we always apply is community mapping. That means we spend time and, and we make sure we spend good time to understand. Again, Dominic. Um, and we lost a tiny bit. Or Please go ahead. <laughs> so community go ahead. Mapping, community mapping. We yes. try to understand the situation of persons with disabilities in their community. What are essential barriers? Often physical accessibility, accessibility of communication. Um, what are the key needs of persons with disabilities? Often it's access to health services, it's access to education, it's access to livelihood opportunities. So how, how can I actually earn a living? How can I provide for my family? And uh, often it's also how can I be part of the social systems and the social environment in the community. So the first bit is really to understand what is the situation on the ground before you even start thinking about the design of a program or a project. That's maybe sure. the first, first element. I would uh, like to start. Yes. Start. And I think listening, listening to what people say and persons with disabilities, they have a crucial role in telling you what are the barriers. So nobody knows better than them to say so. So yes. So that was some sketchy information about CBID. Thank you so much, Dominique. So what happened, I would say now, let's say that was the pre-COVID and now we have the COVID-19 coming in and we were all unprepared. Italy, Germany, any country was unprepared. Globally, we were unprepared. So uh, let us see what happened to persons with disabilities with COVID-19. So that's a really a challenge, even more a challenge, I would say, in the developing countries and the CBID. So uh, give, just give us some idea of what was the situation of these persons with disabilities experience during the emergency. Mm -hmm. So again, to understand this, I would say we need to take one step back. Generally okay. speaking, 
in emergency situations, persons with disabilities are often forgotten. Yeah, and that's yeah. not particular to COVID-19. It has happened in, in many emergency situations before. Um, people start to design a response, governments start to design a response, and no one thinks about the particular needs of persons with yes. disabilities. And in this is actually a big mistake because, as you mentioned before, there's one billion persons with disabilities living worldwide, and actually one in three of them is older than 60 years. So when you start yes, thinking yes. now um, of the most vulnerable groups, um, uh, but in the situation of uh, the Corona crisis, uh, we all know it's it's elderly people, it's people who have maybe chronic diseases, uh, it's people who uh, find it difficult to to do social distancing, and you can you, you immediately understand persons with disabilities are actually at the center of these uh, most vulnerable groups, together with others, but they are hugely hugely affected. So what 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 really really happened in the first place with COVID nineteen is um, as societies went into lockdown situation for many persons with disabilities their support system simply broke down yeah uh, many persons with disabilities they depend on a caregiver work um, being with them they depend on their own social networks um, uh, and and many of these networks have actually uh, collapsed and put persons with disabilities into a very difficult situation um, I, can't, I could maybe try and you know summarize it in a few points and say um, in the current context, persons with disabilities have an increased risk of contracting COVID-19. Often it's difficult for them to access sync. Sometimes they need to touch their face more often. Uh, of um, course. They have more difficulty in, um, in acting social distancing or self-isolation because they need to remain in close contact with other people. Um, they have often an increased risk of developing a severe case because they have underlying health conditions. And if they contract the disease, often there are much more barriers for them to actually get appropriate care. So you can see all in all, um, um, COVID-19 has very much affected persons with disabilities. And um, even for us as an organization, as, as CBM, uh, a big headache in the beginning at least to adjust and we're constantly adjusting because we're working with some of the most vulnerable people in the current situation. Of course, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think also, you know, I, I think many persons with disabilities also in Italy experience difficulties with the COVID-19. So the, somehow the, this pandemic made it possible to to emerge and come to the surface, certain conditions of discrimination, let's say, uh, persons with disabilities experience worldwide, and of course, in this case, specific in the developing countries where infrastructures are not, you know, that well equipped, and also there's a social stigma. Combination is a quite a challenge. But I, I'm, what I'm saying also is that the CBID is a fantastic approach usually because you work with a community, so you have a long lasting impact. It's a fantastic way of uh, building resilience also, I would say, you know, resilience during emergency times. So I think through CBID, we do have also this. Uh, you know, um, con consequence of impact and then uh, building resilience is actually uh, a plus in this case. Um, we know that in emergencies, uh, things are running super fast. We know that. And it's difficult to say now, okay, what are the best practices because things are running fast, but then maybe we already have some good practices we could share, let's say good at least. Uh, things are running fast, so probably you learn fast too, uh, because you must, right? So maybe if you can offer some practical example or good practice we already have experience of, uh, that could be a suggestion for people who like, you know, to include persons with disabilities in the development sector now, and they are facing COVID, persons with disabilities, inclusion, all these factors together. So, uh, if you have some suggestions, I think that will help also uh, the participant to understand, you know, what is actually working better, let's say. Over to you, Dominic. Yeah. 
Thanks, Kiara. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, I, I would, I would really want to also um, be very positive here and to say there yes. is hope. So some, some really good, good practices and good practice examples have emerged um, during the COVID nineteen uh, response so far. Uh, and as you said, being in the communities and having a long term engagement with the communities is a very powerful approach. And it, yes. it shows its power in situations like the current crisis, because there are links between members of the community that have been longstanding. In some of our community programs, um, we have implemented uh, um, disaster preparedness measures. So people yes. were, to a certain extent, prepared to situations that, that are very challenging. So that was helpful to start with. And then we have seen that, that we could actually capitalize on, on these elements of resilience. So a few good examples are there. Um, I, could, I could say, for instance, um, uh, state, state the example of where we have supported governments to make their COVID-19 response accessible to persons with disabilities. So we, we made sure that communication material is accessible. We made sure uh, whenever uh, there was uh, government um, spots, uh, for instance, TV spots or official communication, that there was sign language interpretation to ensure that uh, persons with disabilities are not excluded from the communication. We worked a lot on these, maybe you've seen these, um, these, these face masks, but that have uh -huh. a window uh -huh. here. Yes. For yes. many persons who can't hear, uh, they read from the lips of people. And imagine yes. now all of a sudden being in a situation where everyone wears a mask that cuts them completely off. Uh, that possibility. So we we uh, we worked with governments to make sure that these um, accessible masks are available um, and that the whole response is uh, is is much more inclusive. One sure, big element sure. I would I, I would really uh, want to mention here is to make sure that uh, the organizations of persons with disabilities are involved in designing the response from the beginning. So a big element for us was also to make sure at community level. Uh, at, often at district level and in countries, sometimes even at national level, to make sure that the organizations of persons with disabilities could explain the situation, their needs, and that the response was designed from the beginning in an accessible way. And then, I mean, there are much more practical examples. Um, uh, for instance, uh, in our community programs where the support chains for persons with disabilities got cut, as I, as I explained before, uh, we, we started actually making sure that, uh, that persons with disabilities have access to uh, medication they need, that persons with disabilities also um, get cash support because very often their sources of income have dried up. So an element we haven't talked about yet, but we might want yes. to talk about later are the economic consequences of per on persons yes. with disabilities of the current situation, which we have also tried to address. So again, we're coming in a way, we're coming back to the methodology I've explained in the beginning try to understand very quickly what the needs of persons with disabilities are and then include these in the response and try to make sure that not only CBM's response programs are inclusive but uh, ideally government response is inclusive because let's also not forget that the major player in this response and I believe that was the case in Italy as well is actually the government so yes. we need to we need to uh, work with the government we need to make sure we also comply with uh, regulations which are evolving all the time um, and and that our programs then actually um, um, are integrated and, and support support the overall response and make sure we reach as many persons with disabilities as possible. Thank you, Dominic. Exactly that. It's like a holistic approach, but at the same time, we have to touch all levels to reach the result and to make sure that actually we have an inclusive emergency response. Thank you so much, Dominic. Thanks so much for the for the time spent with us. We we hope that we, although it was a bit bumpy webinar or session now, because we had to come uh, come here and going, uh, but that's life. That's our life probably now. Uh, so we hope uh, we provided some insight of what the community-based inclusive development is and the, the power, the power of you know changing uh, the life of persons with disabilities and the communities. So the communities is actually responsible for that uh, and the society overall. So. Uh, whatever we were not able to to say, I would say 
with words. Uh, we will ask now the organizer of the festival um, and the technical support if they can uh, paste a link uh, of, the, of the video that we recently developed, Dominic, and it was also a fruit of collaboration between uh, you know, our, let's say, international <laughs> group. Uh, where we we explain with images what is CVID and what was the inclusive response in, in relation to, to COVID-19. So what, what didn't come through uh, to words now hopefully will come with images uh, in a, you know through the video. Um, let me just mention that this uh, session and dialogue has been recorded, so will be available on the website of the Global Hub Festival and will also be available on the website of CBM Italia, so www.cbmitalia.org. And I thank you everyone, thank you so much Dominic for being with us, uh, thank you to all the participants. I don't see specific uh, comments now and um, questions so all was clear <laughs> and hopefully uh, you know a good start for thinking about community-based inclusive development so I wish you you Dominic and all the participants uh, a, a good uh, rest of the day enjoy good evening to everyone thank bye. you Chiara my pleasure thank you thanks a lot. bye thanks